Thanks for stopping by the channel today. My name is Jason. I'm KC5HWB. This is the extra class. This is the final class in the three classes of amateur radio licensing that exist in the United States today. Some of my most popular videos on this channel have been the technician class and the general class, which is class one and class two, or level one and level two, if you will. This is level three. This is the final level. This is the top license you can get. And I want to thank the North Richland Hills Amateur Radio Club for allowing me to record this Zoom class they did at the uh, end of 2020, beginning of 2021. It was about eight, six to seven hour sessions, so you're in for a wild ride today. <laughs> uh, go through them as many times as you want to. Uh, fast forward, stop, pause, rewind, whatever you want to do. Play them over and over again. This is good information for those of you who are currently a general and wanting to upgrade to Amateur Extra. Thank you to the North Richland Hills Amateur Radio Club. Their website will be linked in the description of the video below, and I hope you enjoy the video series. The first session will be amps and power supplies, page 111 in your book. So let me get those files ready. We will be taking a break after this section along about uh 10 20 10 25 and i'm planning to watch the time Hugh. if we get bogged down uh you're welcome to watch the time and break in and remind me that we need to get moving and let me get this window out of the way okay we need to stop that share we need to get, make sure I've got the other, uh, where'd it go? Amps and power supplies we got. And then I need the study sheet for that. This is the study sheet that you downloaded. If you can't download it, there's a, a note on that page that I just turned off. Everybody got it downloaded that wants it. Amps and power supplies. Okay, here we go. Then let me get this sharing. Where's the, here it is. Okay, share, amps and power supplies. Okay, as you may remember, I'm not the most excellent expert Zoom operator. Therefore, I may stumble a bit, but we'll get there. Um, <clears throat> also, Hugh, sometimes if there's discussion or questions and somebody brings up something, can you do this, or there's a question about it, or something that I promise to send later, um, would you make a note and send me an email afterwards so that I can make sure that everything we've promised gets covered? Okay. okay. That just helps. And if there's questions like on the chat that don't get answered, I put those in the notes and we'll answer those later with an email. <clears throat> now I need to hide this one. Okay. Um, this window. Well, it's not working just right about this way. Okay, that works. Okay, amplifiers and power supplies. Um, this is some discussion. A lot of these figures will show up in the questions, so we'll just go over them briefly so that you can get a feel for where we're headed with this section today. This first block is the grounded grid power amplifier. This is commonly found by Google searching on the internet. 
and you can build your own power amplifier. Uh, this would make a linear power amp with a tube. Uh, this thing in the middle is a tube and it's be, it'd be a power tube. The B plus for this circuit would be like 1200 to 1500 volts. And it would like to run an amp or amp and a half. So you can have 2000 watts input. And if you get everything working just right and the tube biased, uh, you might get a thousand watts RF out. Almost the legal limit, depending on what mode you're running and, and stuff is that. Uh, looks like there's might be a resistor missing here off the cathode, cathode bias or cathode to ground. This is the RF parts. The significant part of this is that there's neutralization involved, which prevents feedback and unwanted oscillations. And, and so that little CN up there uh, is just an adjustable resistor. And I haven't personally built these, but I've read about them for years and years in the radio amateur handbook from ARRL. That's an excellent source of information on how to make this circuit work, how to match the input impedance to your transmitter output, uh, how to build the power supply for 1200 to 1500 volts, and how to make the tank circuit, which is how you tune the output of this amplifier to the antenna. Antenna match network is what that would be called. So here you want to watch out for CN, the neutralizing capacitor that prevents unwanted oscillations. Uh, this diagram is a push-pull amplifier made with transistors, a lot lower voltage, and it's demonstrating the waveforms involved in the push-pull amplifier. That is, you've got your input on the left, input signal on the left, <clears throat> and one of them will be inverted. And so you feed those through this bias network to the two transistors, one a NPN, one a PNP. And so each transistor will amplify half of the input waveform. The PNP amplifies the negative half because that input to it has been inverted. You combine these back through a transformer where the VCC power comes into the center tap of the transformer for the collectors. Uh, transformer combines both halves of the wave, signal wave, and comes out the output. And then RL is the load for that amplifier. Uh, now I've got the magnification too big and we can't see all this. This diagram is a method to temperature stabilize a bipolar junction amplifier. Uh, if, you're, if you're used to working with bipolar junction transistors, you know that they can have thermal runaway. That is when they get warm, they conduct better and conduct more current, which makes them even hotter. And so they conduct more current. Uh, the resistance goes down because they're hot. They conduct more current, they get even hotter. So they sit there and burn themselves up. Well, that's not a very smart thing to do. So what happens is you put this R3 down here in series with the emitter, which provides some feedback so that when the transistor gets hot and conducts more current, it, it shuts off some of the bias on the emitter so the transistor will conduct less current. So there's a feedback, a thermal to electronic feedback here with the emitter with resistor R3. And that will uh, slow down or prevent the thermal runaway from uh, bipolar transistor amplifiers. 
Next, we're going to be talking about voltage regulators. Well, let's see. Now there's there's one more amplifier we talk about. Um, here, this way. Amplifiers and power supplies. Here's a, an amplifier called a common collector amplifier. The other name for it is emitter follower. And uh, you, you get a high impedance input with the low impedance output. It can run current because the current to the output means it's a low impedance output. The what does it mean my internet connection is unstable? Uh, am I coming, is audio coming across okay? I we lost you for a minute, but you're back now. Oh, I'm sorry. How long was it gone? Basically the explanation on this, this uh, emitter. On, on this emitter follower. Okay, I'll start over then. Emitter follower, it's also called a common collector amplifier because the collector is at signal ground. Uh, VCC and, and B plus always has to be at signal ground. Uh, you can't have signal through your DC power supply. Uh, that would be a problem. So here the collector is connected directly to VCC. You have a high impedance input through this capacitor, it's a blocking capacitor, which blocks the, the bias on the base from getting back into your input. Uh, the output is a low impedance output because it can supply lots of current through the transistor without any intervening impedance. Uh, there's no voltage gain in this circuit. So that's what you, um, you have in the uh, emitter follower common collector amplifier. Now on to voltage regulators. The first voltage regulator I used was a Fairchild UA7805. It took in anywhere between eight volts and 20 volts and provided five volts out for TTL logic. That was very important back when these were popular. Five volt output, fixed voltage output. There are now similar circuits. This is a single integrated circuit with three connections. Uh, and one connection is ground where the input and output are both referenced. Uh, it can give you an amp, amp and a half which was important because TTL drew lots of current because it's a low impedance, high current logic family. We'll get to that later in components. But that's one way of doing a regulator is a fixed three terminal regulator. Uh, this figure is in your book. It's one provided with the question pool. It's a standard question. Uh, the things to look for here, Q1 will be called a pass transistor because it passes from the input, the 25 volts, to the regulated output of 12 volts. Uh, there's capacitors for bypass to keep from high frequency oscillations happening. C2 is an important capacitor. It keeps ripple. Usually there's ripple, like 120 hertz ripple from the AC rectifier on this 25 volts. So C2 will keep that ripple off of the Zener diode. D1 is a Zener diode. It's the reference voltage in this regulator and sets the output voltage. So you would want D1 to be close to 12 volts or you could change it up and down a half a volt or a volt to get the output or even change D1 to different Zener voltages to get different output voltages. And this, this makes a very good uh, voltage regulator. I've used it in lots of circuits. Let's see, let me decrease this. Okay, 
Now, you see this pulse train along the bottom? This is a variable duty cycle square wave that would control a switch such as a MOSFET. And, and you can build a voltage regulator in this method by using uh, a pulse train, which would be derived from voltage comparators. Uh, a uh, microprocessor can even do this. A microprocessor can be the control element for a, a, a switching power supply. This would be a rudimentary switching power supply uh, ver by varying the duty cycle of the on pulses to the switch. Now this uh, wavy curve right here shows you how the current is going up and down. So when there's high current draw from this uh, regulator, you've got the, the pulse width on most of the time. When there's low current drawing out of this regulator, you've got a low duty cycle coming from the uh, control element. And so you have feedback from the output to the input and, and the uh, control element, whether it's comparators or a microprocessor, will sit there and change the duty cycle of, the, of this pulse train. And so keeping the voltage, the output voltage constant. So the output voltage is fed back to the control element. It calculates what the pulse width should be to keep that constant. The pulse train is fed to a filter. It'd be a low pass filter, uh, usually a choke and, and capacitor, or maybe two sections of choke and capacitor, another section of choke and capacitor to follow this. And so it, it filters out the switching waveform and all that's left is the uh, steady output DC current, which is what you want. Uh, this, may not, this method may not be so good for linear circuits or linear amplifiers because there's going to be some hash noise, what used to be called hash noise. Real high frequency noise is what that is on the output. And so that may, de may need more filtering with the low pass filter before you use it. Let's see, what else are we missing? Okay, right here in the middle of this picture is a method to make the 1200 volts for your power amplifier. This, this would be a method to make the uh, filter capacitor, the electrolytic capacitor out of lower voltage capacitors because 1200 volt to 1500 or 2000 volt electrolytic caps are rare and expensive. So you can use lower voltage capacitors like uh, this 100 microfarad 450 volt cap is a real common value for electrolytics. So here I've put four of them in series. Well, one drawback from putting capacitors in series is the total capacitance across the string is divided by the number of capacitors. And there's, there's a, a method of calculating capacitance if they're not all equal capacitors. It, capacitors in series works like resistors in parallel. The, the value, the total value goes down. So here the total value of the, the total capacitance would be 25 microfarads, but by stacking the capacitors in series, you can achieve, uh, it'd be a 1600 volt rating, but I wouldn't run it close to that. 1200 volts is about right and 1200 to 1300 volts would be just right for our uh, grounded grid amplifier. Now the question is gonna be about what are these resistors doing in parallel with capacitors? What those resistors do is to balance the voltage across each of the four capacitors. Without those, there's gonna be a, uh, a high voltage built up on one or two of these, just depending on the leakage current in each capacitor. Well, here I've swamped out the capacitor's leakage current with these bleeder resistors. They're called bleed resistors. 
and I've chosen a five milliamp bleed current. Uh, so each resistor is what? It's 300 volts I'm wanting across each capacitor divided by the five milliamps, that's Ohm's law. So you need to know Ohm's law just right off the top of your head all the time. So here the, it calculates out, well, the calculation would be 60K. There's no 60K resistor, so you use a 62K, and then you have to figure out I squared R, the power in each resistor is five milliamps time, squared times the 62K, which gives you a watt and a half. So you would buy two watt resistors to use for these bleeder resistors here. And what they do is equalize out the voltage across the capacitors in series. Now this figure that's up here that I just messed up. Okay, here. This shows you the load line. This we'll use in transistor amplifiers. Uh, this, these curves right here that look like a, a hay pitchfork is what it reminds me of. I used to run one of those when I was a kid. And some of you still might have a hay pitchfork. I've, I've got out of that business. Uh, but, but those are the characteristic curves of a transistor as it goes from cut off to saturated up here for the highest currents. Transistors will saturate at the highest currents and they just can't put out any more current. So the load line is drawn from the highest current to the highest voltage that you can put on the transistor. And that's a straight line. That's called the load line for a transistor amplifier. It depends on the biasing, depends on the transistor that you're using. And so the point of this is to bias the transistor amplifier at different points, depending on what amplifier class that you're running. So if you want a linear amplifier, that's class A, that's biased right here in the midpoint between saturation and cutoff. And this is your output waveform. So if you, if you bias the transistor down here toward cutoff, you're going to get part of the waveform cut off. I mean, the transistor is cut off, which means it's turned off, it's not conducting. And then the waveform has a flat spot in it. And so it's not conducting the full 360 degree cycle. Uh, one cycle of your uh, signal right here would be referred to as 360 degrees. And so class B amplifiers would, would conduct 180 degrees, class AB somewhere between 180 and 360, and class C amplifier where the transistor is operated below cutoff just gives you a very peak of current and that would be operated less than 180 degree duty cycle, 180 degrees of the signal cycle. Uh, I think we covered all that. A lot of these will show up in our list of questions and that looks good. And let me stop sharing this page and we'll go to sharing, uh, let's see, amps and power supplies, question section. So let me get it on the screen and we will, let's see, back to the Zoom and I need to share. We'll share this one. Okay, you see, you see a thing, amps and power supplies at the top? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's a, that's a yes? Yes. Very good, okay. Then let me hide this control so I can see my screen, what I'm doing. Okay, here we go. Uh, as
as a review, we're only four today. Next week will be planned to be the last week for week five, and everybody should have emails with that syllabus in it. Uh, amps and power supplies, first question. Oh, this is about external RF amplifiers when CB radio operators got hold of the hams linear amplifiers and they were using hundreds of watts to thousands of watts to talk across the country. Well, CB radio was not licensed for that back in the 1960s and 70s. So the FCC had to make rules to clamp down on that. So this first question deals with how can a dealer sell RF power amplifiers capable of operation below 144 megahertz without FCC certification. Let me get my highlighter out. So used to be uh, anybody could go to a radio dealer. There, there used to be actual stores that were radio stores, uh, but they're long gone. Um, back in the 60s and 70s. And the key is below 144 megahertz. They can still sell amplifiers at 144 and above, but there's not many of those. They're kind of rare. And I doubt if there's any store you can go in and buy them. Uh, the answer A, it, was, it would have to be purchased in used condition from an amateur radio operator and is sold to another amateur operator for use at that station, that operator's station, because it got even got so bad that some hams were buying these amplifiers, selling them to their CB radio friends. Of course, with the huge markup, but still that didn't stop the problem of CB radio people not knowing how to run the amplifiers, not knowing about distortion and spurious signals coming out of them and messing up everybody's TVs. That's where every, uh, all the analog TVs would be affected by 28 megahertz, 27 megahertz signals uh, if they were putting out spurious signals. Now, a follow-up question is, uh, same topic, which describes one of the standards that must be met by an external RF amplifier if it's to qualify for the FCC certification. Uh, what standard must it operate to for FCC certification? It must satisfy the spurious emission standards when operated at the lesser of 1500 watts, which is maximum legal output or its full output. That, that would be the requirement to, for an external RF amplifier to receive the RF FCC certification. The other ones don't really matter. They're just gobbledygook. But the one right answer is the amplifier has to meet spurious emission standards when operated at its full power or 1500 watts. And you're not supposed to operate it above 1500 watts anyway. Oh, here's this common collector question. Uh, as a review, it's a low impedance output, which can provide lots of current, as much current as you can get through the transistor with the high impedance input. And there's no voltage gain on the common collector amplifier. Now let's see if we can answer the question. Which of the following describes the emitter follower, also called a common collector amplifier? It would be an, the amplifier with low impedance that follows the base input voltage. And that would imply no voltage gain. So that's what you get with an emitter follower. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> that is the characteristic of an emitter follower. Uh, they're very handy sometimes because you have a high impedance signal that you want to amplify and drive a uh, heavy load, such as a big capacitive load. 
and, and that would require low impedance output. Here's our transistor load lines again. We just talked about that where you've got the load line across the transistor characteristic curves as it's biased in the circuit. Then you bias the operating point where you put the AC signal on top of <clears throat> and class A amplifier would conduct for 360 degrees of this sine wave. The AB would conduct between 180 and 360 degrees. The class B amplifier conducts for 180 degrees and the class C less than that. And with the class C, because it's chopped, it's going to give you lots of harmonics. So there's particular questions about these. Let's go through these. So where on the load line of a class A common emitter amplifier, which is what we're talking about, would the bias be set? For class A, you want it halfway between saturation and cutoff. That way you get the highest signal swing because what's going to happen, this AC signal is going to ride up and down this load line. Up here, it's going to give you lots of current with lower voltage out. Down here toward cutoff, it's going to give you much less current with a higher voltage. And so to get the maximum AC signal swing here as the operating point goes up and down with the AC signal on top of the DC bias, it's going to give you the, the highest output and the least amount of, of um, distortion. Because if you get one end of the AC signal up here, in, in transistor saturation, it's going to distort the peak of the signal. And if you get it into cutoff, it's going to distort the bottom peak. And so you, you want the highest output you can get and the lowest amount of distortion. And that's a class A, very linear transistor amplifier. What portion of the signal does an active element in a push-pull class AB amplifier conduct? Remember the push-pull diagram we went through? Is that the next page? Oh, here it is. Yeah, I did put it in here. Okay, remember the class, uh, this is a class AB transistor push-pull amplifier. Uh, one transistor conducts one half, the other transistor conducts the other half. Each half is referred to as 180 degrees. So what portion of each active cycle, it says more than 180, but less than 360. Uh, it says that because there can be some overlap and the transformer will take care of putting the two halves back together. So it's not exactly 180. In a, the push-pull, you could have more than 180, but less than 360. And that is on our load line diagram here, more than 180, less than 360 for the class AB amplifier. Um, okay, push pull. Which of the following amplifier types reduces even order harmonics? That's what the push pull amplifier does. There's no even order harmonics in a push-pull amplifier. What even order harmonics will give you DC offset, and there's no DC offset that you can get out of a transformer output. The way these transistors are arranged, and because see, what push-pull means that one transistor's on while the other one's off, and so this top one turns off while the bottom Q2 is, is turned on running current. And so it's going to combine their outputs in a transformer and the output will not have even order harmonics. Even order harmonics give you DC offset in the output. And so the push pull will not do that. It reduces even order harmonics. The odd order harmonics come up when you clip amplifiers. Here's our grounded grid power amplifier. Uh, what's important here is that you, 
you have to neutralize it with the CN. Uh, the capacitances, let's talk about capacitances for a minute. The B plus capacitance, you remember we showed how to put a bunch of electrolytic capacitors together. It's like 25, maybe 100 microfarads or maybe less capacitance than that if you're running higher voltage. Uh, the C from cathode to grid is a small capacitance. That would be inner tube and connection capacitance in the tube. This C capacitance here is between the plate and the grid. That's also an inner tube capacitance. And those are on the order of like 10 to maybe 20 or 30 picofarads. They might be more for a big, one of the big, huge uh, two or three inch diameter power amplifier tubes that you're trying to make this for. I mean, one tube can run a thousand watts uh, if you get the right tube and the right circuit. And so their capacitance could be several tens of picofarads. Well, that's going to all be unbalanced and, and have some feedback if you don't use this neutralizing capacitor, which could be uh, a picofarad or two or even less than a picofarad, a tenth of a picofarad or a few tenths. So it's going to be a very small capacitor and probably variable. I didn't mark this as a variable cap, but it's usually a variable capacitor. And the one transmitter I had one time was, was using tubes. So I had to neutralize it. I neutralized it on 10 meters at the highest frequency it could run. And it's a little variable capacitor that provides some out of phase See the, the phases of the outputs, this tube will invert the signal coming in. And invert means 180 degrees out of phase. So it takes part of the 180 degree out of phase signal, adds it to the input, and so neutralizes uh, spurious oscillations. So a characteristic of a grounded grid amplifier, that's the amplifier we just saw. Uh, it has, uh, doesn't have to have those, but it will have low input impedance. And in fact, if you uh, get the right uh, input matching network, it can match the 50 ohms of your uh, 50 or 100 watt output transmitter. And so it will have a low input impedance. How can the RF power amplifier be neutralized? That's by feeding 180 degree out of phase portion from of the output back to the input. And that's what the neutralizing capacitor does. It feeds some out of phase signal, very small amount through one or two picofarads. You're not gonna get a lot at 30 megahertz, 28, 29 megahertz. Uh, or even 144 megahertz, the neutralizing capacitor may be uh, a tenth of a picofarad or less. You, you remember a capacitor's impedance goes down as frequency goes up. So it, you have to take all that into account when figuring out capacitors in RF circuits. Why are odd order intermod distortion products of concern in linear amplifiers. Why would you worry about odd order harmonics? It's because they can be relatively close in frequency to the desired signal. And so your signal, your RF output from this linear power amp will come out and distort your output signal, which you want to be linear. I mean, sideband, amplifiers have to be linear amplifiers. They, they have to be linear to uh, transmit FT8. FT8 is an analog signal that depends on the linearity of the amplifiers and receiver that you're using to run FT8. Uh, so it has to all be linear and you don't want any intermod distortion products mixing in with your output signal that will uh, give you distortion and make the 
uh, receiver hard to lock onto that and receive your signal. What can be done to prevent unwanted oscillations in an RF power amp? One thing you do is install parasitic suppressors, which are ferrite beads or neutralize the stage. We talked about neutralization. Uh, the leads to the uh, socket for the tube will likely have ferrite beads on it. Ferrite bead is, makes a little bit of inductance, uh, makes it like a small choke, a few nanohenries of inductance that, uh, and you, you remember the inductance, the, the impedance of chokes, inductance, goes up with frequency. And so as high frequency oscillations get started, these parasitic suppressors or ferrite chokes are going to present high impedances in the leads going to the tube. And so those oscillations won't sustain and, and they'll be minimized and, and preferably not even get started. So it's unwanted oscillations by parasitic suppressors and neutralization. Which of the following is likely result when a class C amplifier is used to amplify a single sideband? Uh, it's not gonna be good. So what, what's it gonna be? Signal distortion and excessive bandwidth. Class C amplifier is a clipping amplifier. It clips the RF signal. So it produces lots of our harmonics. And that's one way you can use, now this is single sideband, so it's gotta be a linear amplifier. If the amplifier doesn't have to be linear, such as for an FM power amplifier, uh, you, you like the harmonics because some FM power amplifiers take a 144 megahertz uh, transmit signal, run it through a class C amplifier and pick off the third harmonic and that would be up in the UHF band at 450 megahertz, 440 to 450 megahertz. And doing that, you will need a, a good harmonic amplifier so the other harmonics don't come out. Uh, the fifth order will come out. Let's see, what's five times 144? Uh, five, 850 to 900 megahertz. You don't want that one being transmitted. You only want the UHF signal. And so that's a class C amplifier. Uh, if you tried to run single sideband through it, uh, too much bandwidth, too many uh, intermod, too, too much, what do you call it? Signal distortion, excessive bandwidth. Let's leave it at that. I'll be quiet. <clears throat> a new type of technology that came along with switching power supplies, class D amplifier. Engineers discovered you could take a class D amplifier and not make it produce DC output, let some audio bandwidth out. And in fact, the, all the audio amplifiers you hear on commercial aircraft or class D amplifiers. Why would you put class D amplifiers on an aircraft? Because they're lightweight. They use switching technology. And in fact, it's a, uh, a power supply switching circuit that you don't fully filter out the AC on the output. The AC is the audio frequency that you get. Uh, up to three or four kilohertz. And you send that to the speaker. Now it turns out that like an eight, <clears throat> an eight ohm speaker is a really lot, is a really good inductance for filtering out uh, hundreds of kilohertz. So a class D amplifier for an audio amplifier could use 150, 200 kilohertz switching frequency. Uh, a little bit of a choke filter and capacitor after it, let three kilohertz through, send that output 
to an audio speaker and you have a class D audio amplifier. And it runs very high efficiency. Uh, it's very compatible with microprocessors and uh, microprocessor systems to put out uh, a pulse wave that would run switches in, in the same topology as a switching power supply, only you don't filter out all the low frequency, you let three kilohertz through and that drives a speaker. So that's a class D amplifier. They're very interesting to work with. Which of the following components form the output of a class D amplifier circuit? Well, if it's a switching coming out, you're gonna need a low pass filter to remove the switching signal components. The switching going on at 150 kilohertz is just an example frequency I picked. It's, it's somewhere in the low kilohertz. It's not as fast as a megahertz. So 150 kilohertz uh, is good enough for a class D amplifier. So you need a low pass filter to remove the switching signal components and leave the audio frequencies. Why are switching amplifiers more efficient than linear amplifiers? They are more efficient. It's because the power transistor is at saturation or cutoff most of the time. It's not running a linear mode. In a linear transistor amplifier, there's current flowing all the time. But a switching amplifier runs current only during the transition between saturation and cutoff. The transistor's fully on or the transistor's turned off. And it, it's a lot more efficient. It uses a lot less. Uh, here's our friend, uh, common emitter amplifier. You know it's a common emitter amplifier because C1 bypasses the emitter to ground for AC ground. It's called uh, biased on with the two bias resistors on the base. You would feed the signal input into the base and you have a collector resistor R4 that works with R3 to put the transistor in a good linear biased region. This is the the circuit you would get that family of curves where we talked about cutoff and saturation. So the purpose of emitter R3 is to give some, some feedback to the thermal instability of this bipolar transistor and keep it from going into thermal runaway. So what's one way to prevent thermal runaway in a bipolar transistor? Amplifier. You use that resistor in series with the emitter. And that's a really handy little linear transistor amplifier stage. It doesn't have a lot of output current. See, because we've got this co collector resistor that's forming part of the bias. And so it can't run a lot of output current. So you might have an output stage with an emitter follower. Get the voltage gain you want in this stage and then use that emitter follower to get current output. And you can drive a heavy load such as a speaker if you want to get audio amplifier or capacitors if you're driving something else. So thermal runaway is prevented with the resistor in series with the emitter. What devices are commonly used as VHF and UHF parasitic suppressors at the terminals of a transistor HF amplifier? That's the ferrite beads. Ferrite beads will suppress VHF and UHF parasitic oscillation. What's the effect of intermodulation products in linear power amplifiers? Intermod products 
make make spurious signals and they go out with your RF that you're trying to transmit, it produces splatter on the band. You can hear it as splatter. Every once in a while you hear, hear a signal that's 10 or 20 or 30 kilohertz wide. If you're close enough to that station, it might be across the whole amateur band. If he's putting out intermod products from his linear amplifier. I won't comment about any neighbors, but every once in a while I hear some of that. Voltage regulator, the 7805. Input, output, ground pins. You put 20 to down to maybe 12 or 10 volts in. The output's five volts. A couple of things uh, you might want to make a note about are the uh, dropout voltage. <clears throat> Any of these semiconductor uh, three terminal regulators have a dropout voltage. That is the minimum voltage the input has to be above the output. So the 7805, if I remember, had about a three volt dropout, which means if I wanted five volts out, I had to have eight here. A uh, number that comes to mind is seven and a half. So the drop, minimum dropout could be two and a half volts just depends on the temperature something like the dropout voltage will be temperature dependent depending on the temperature of the integrated circuit inside here now all, all this regulator would be built in one piece of silicon as an integrated circuit another thing you need to watch out for is the total dissipation of this package the ones that i used to build with were the big metal can to3s now they're uh, TO220s that are getting old. Uh, they're little bitty surface mount packages. So you couldn't run uh, an amp and a half through this circuit uh, if the input was 25 volts and the output five volts. Why not? Uh, because the power of this dissipates is the voltage you're dropping times the current you're taking out of it. So if there's 25 on the input, five on the output, that means there's 20 volts across this regulator. 20 volts times an amp and a half is 30 watts. 30 watts is gonna melt a little bitty surface mount package off a PC board. A TO3 on a big, huge heat sink, which is the way I built my regulator, uh, could probably take 30 watts. It just depends on the uh, thermal resistance of this package to the heat sink. So you, you have to watch the uh, dropout voltage and the power dissipation. I think there's questions about those. Oh, here, dropout voltage of the analog voltage regulator. So what is the dropout voltage? It's the minimum input to output voltage required to maintain regulation. Because if the input voltage goes down below this dropout voltage re that's required for your five volt output regulated voltage, the output voltage is, is going to droop. So if the minimum voltage is three volts and the input voltage went down to seven, you're going to get four volts out. The regulator is going to try its hardest to keep the output voltage as high as, it's can, as it can, but it can't do any better than this dropout voltage. This is our figure E72. This will appear with the question if you get this question on the test in your extra exam and it wants to know about some of these components. Remember we talked about these, the 25 volts is the input, 12 volts is the output. Q1 is a pass transistor. That's what passes the current from the input to the output. D1 is a zener diode. That's the voltage reference that sets the output voltage. Uh, C2 is a capacitor that keeps the ripple and noise from the input supply off of your reference so that the output doesn't have that ripple and noise reflected through the regulator. 
How does the linear electronic voltage regulator work? Uh, the conduction of the control element is varied to maintain the constant output voltage. A voltage regulator wants constant output voltage. That's, that's what its job is. And so a linear electronic regulator varies the conduction of the control element. Now in this regulator, the control element is the pass transistor. In the 7805, it's an integrated circuit which has a pass transistor in it, but there's other stuff that goes along with it. But it's the control element is varied to give you the constant output voltage. What device is typically used as a stable voltage reference in a linear voltage regulator? What was that part? It was the Zener diode that was the voltage reference for that regulator. Here's this pulse train that's changing its duty cycle to accommodate different output currents. Again, you want to keep the voltage constant. Uh-oh, well, that's because this is a picture. It's not text, so I can't highlight the text. Yeah, whatever. So you remember it, and it has an output filter to keep out this high frequency switching noise from getting out on your DC output. The whole point of this is to keep the voltage output constant. What's the characteristic of a switching electronic voltage regulator? Um, the control device's duty cycle is changed to produce the constant output voltage. What happened to my marker? The duty cycle is changed to produce the constant average output voltage. The point of the circuit is the constant output voltage and it changes the duty cycle. This is a switching electronic voltage regulator. Which of the following types of linear voltage regulators usually make the most efficient use of the power source? Linear voltage regulator, most efficient type is a series regulator. That's because these other ones a, a current source makes the makes the uh, input voltage be too high because it works from a high voltage and then uh, provides a constant current output. A shunt regulator will, no, I don't want to highlight that. A shunt regulator will draw a constant current through the output. And so it's constantly at the highest current that the power supply could put out. <clears throat> so you don't want anything about current. You don't want a shunt regulator. You want the series regulator right here. That's the 7805 with the series voltage regulator. What's the equation for calculating power dissipated? We want to calculate the power dissipated by the series linear voltage regulator. My marker's not working. What would be the equation? Remember how we figured that? It's the voltage difference from input to output times the output current. Because that voltage can't just disappear anywhere. The voltage is stopped by the control element, which is the pass transistor. And that pass transistor is going to dissipate power because it's running the output current. That's how you calculate the power dissipation in a transistor. The difference of input to output voltage times the output current. What is the function of the pass transistor in a linear voltage regulator? What the pass transistor do? It maintained the constant output voltage over different load currents. That's the pass transistor is the 
operating element. That's what makes it work. It has other pieces around it, but the pass transistor maintains that output voltage. Which of the following types of linear voltage regulator places a constant load on the unregulated voltage source? A linear voltage regulator and a constant load. That would be the shunt regulator. The shunt regulator places a constant load on the input source. E72, see next page. What's E72 about? That's the one we've been talking about, but we already know that circuit. Okay. So in that figure, E72, and you don't have to memorize the figure. That figure will be given to you with the question if you get that question on your test. So don't, don't worry about memorizing the figure. Just remember how it works. What's the purpose of Q1? Remember what Q1 is? Where's Q1? Q1's here. Everybody should know the answer by now. We've said it a dozen times. It controls the current supply to the load. It's the pass transistor. That's the control element in this circuit. Q1 controls the, the current that's going to the load. What's the purpose of C2 in the circuit? Where was C2? You remember what C2 did? Uh, what's the answer? It bypasses the rectifier output ripple around D1. Rectifier output ripple is coming off the input voltage because usually the way I used to build them, I had a transformer off the AC line, a bridge rectifier. So I had uh, 120 Hertz AC coming in here and this filter cap C1 would filter that out a bit. But in this regulator, you don't want any of that 120 Hertz showing up on your output. So you have to bypass that with the aid of R1 forms a low pass filter. So C2 bypasses that ripple and noise on your input voltage from getting to D1, which is the Zener regulator. That's a Zener diode regulator reference for the linear voltage regulator. And those work very well. I've built lots of those in my life. And most, and as far as I know, the ones I built are all still working. I use them like for bench type power supplies. It's very easy to build. What type of circuit is shown in figure E72? That's the one we've been looking at. That's the linear voltage regulator. I lost my marker again. Okay, so figure E72, you don't have to memorize the figure, but if you see this, what does it look like? You got a pass transistor, you got a voltage reference that makes a linear voltage regulator. That's what that circuit is, a linear voltage regulator. Oh, okay, here's our string of uh, capacitors in series with the bleed resistors that are balancing the voltage on each of the electrolytic caps in series. What's the question about? What's the purpose of connecting the equal value resistors across power supply filter caps in series? What was the purpose? Uh, it equalizes the voltage on each cap. It discharges the caps when voltage is removed. That's very important. You don't want those hanging around at 1200 volts and you go fishing around inside with your hands, you're gonna get zapped. It provides a minimum load on the supply. Uh, a high voltage supply like this, uh, 1200 volts is gonna be, have some variation with load current. And so these resistors also provide a minimum load for that supply. That's, that's why after I, I drew the picture and did the calculation, then I read the question and going like, well, five milliamps might not be enough. Uh, you might need more than that, 10 or 20 milliamps. Uh, but if you do that and you get even 62 or, or 10 k ohm resistors, 
you're going to have a lot of power dissipated in the bleeder resistors. So that's a balance when you're designing this type of power supply. But this, this is the purpose of having those resistors in there. The, the answer is D, all the, all the choices are correct. But the reasons are they equalize the voltage on the cap. They discharge the cap when the voltage is removed. That's referred to as bleeder resistors. And they provide the minimum load on the power supply, which is very important that that helps stabilize the power supply without having to have a voltage regulator. What's the purpose of the step start circuit in a high voltage power supply? A step start circuit. It's one where as the electrolytic filter caps charge up, it will introduce more input voltage. It's a step start. It could be based on time. It can be based on voltage. But if you had a time circuit on the input rectifier, uh, the step start would start off the filter capacitors at a lower voltage and increase the voltage on them gradually as the voltage builds up. You don't want to hit a big bank of electrolytic capacitors with 2000 volts. Uh, it stresses the parts. It draws an excessively large wad of current from the supply. Uh, it might damage something, it might blow the fuse, uh, but the step start circuit allows the filter caps to charge gradually. Uh, what is the current in the primary winding of a transformer called if no load is on the secondary? That's called the magnetizing current. The transformer has a magnetizing current. See, this is in the primary with no load attached to the secondary. A transformer, if you just energize the primary from the, the line, 120 volts or 240, if it's a high power transformer for your two kilowatt uh, power amplifier, uh, you might hook it up to 220 volt supply, AC supply. And so it's gonna draw a little bit of current without anything on the secondary. And that's called the magnetizing current. It can be a little bit, if it gets to be excessive, that means your transformer might not be working right or it's got a shorted turn or it's just gonna be inefficient. It's gonna get hot when it works. And, and it, none of those reasons are good, but it's called the magnetizing current. What is the primary reason a high frequency switching type? This is a high frequency switching type, high voltage power supply can be less expensive and lighter weight than the conventional power supply. Instead of having a power transformer that weighs 30 pounds, you can get a high frequency switching power supply it's because the high frequency inverter design uses much smaller transformers and filter components. One, they're smaller, two, they're lighter weight. Because in a linear power supply, it works off 60 hertz or 50 hertz if you live in Europe or other parts of the world. And those are very, very heavy. You have to have lots of iron to have a 50 or 60 hertz transformer. If the transformer is running at 150 kilohertz, they're very lightweight. They're, they're a small toroid. They're a small uh, open frame transformer and very small components. You don't have uh, big electrolytic filter caps that are the size of a drinking glass. They're tiny quarter inch square surface mount uh, capacitors, they could be electrolytic or like uh, aluminum or tantalum, but they're very much smaller. They're very lighter weight for the switching type high voltage power supply. Oh, we're done. We're ready to begin the components in your new rig section. In Gordon West book, it's page 175. If you're following along in the book, 
Oh, a reminder. If you haven't sent your name and call sign to the chat window, please do that. And in case you missed the announcement, there are five files, which are the study sheets for today's topics in the chat window file section. You can download those. Uh, most, well, I think now all the figures will be in the question list, except maybe this section, components in your new rig. I didn't do that. I don't remember. We'll find out. But we'll go over that study sheet first, components in your new rig. And I'm ready to start sharing that. Components in your new rig study sheet. So everybody put your name and call sign in the chat window. And we'll know you're here, that you're alive. And we'll start looking at these components. Okay, components in your new rig. Uh, semiconductor materials are silicon, use silicon, the most common type. Uh, in some microwave circuits, you can use gallium arsenide and some other exotic materials. They're way faster and cost more. They can also take a higher temperature than silicon can. So that's an advantage in uh, microwave circuits so you can run them hotter. N-type semiconductor has free electrons. P-type is semiconductor that has acceptor impurities that adds holes. Now holes is a space where an electronic isn't. Is anybody hearing me? Yeah, we got you. Yeah, we got you. Okay. All right. We can hear you. Thank you. I was concerned that the silence meant nothing was going on. Okay, so if you can hear me, we'll continue. The concept of holes and semiconductors is hard for some people if you're not visual. Uh, what it means is there's a place around an atom, a silicon atom, where an electron should be but it isn't, that's a hole. That's what makes P-type material. Because if you take one of the electrons off of a silicon atom, it has a positive net charge. So that would be P-type material, whereas N-type material has excess electrons. There's more electrons in there trying to find places around the atoms and they're free to move. It has free electrons and N-type material would be associated with negative charge. Let's talk about diodes for a minute. A diode is the simplest semiconductor component there is. It's got a piece of P-silicon and a piece of N-silicon or other material, whatever it is. For now, we'll just talk about silicon but it's P-silicon right up against an N-silicon piece. The P side has holes in it. The inside has electrons in it. The electrons all have a negative charge. And you need to remember that. That's very important in talking about semiconductors. If you reverse bias, that is put the positive side of a battery on the end, terminal, which is the cathode, as shown right below the PN junction, then you're going to reverse bias this diode and there's no current going to flow. Well, obviously, you put a positive side of a battery plus voltage on the cathode, the negative side hooked to the anode, that's reverse bias, nothing's going to happen, no current flows. If you turn the battery around, you put the positive side of a battery on the anode of this diode, which is the P side, and the negative side to the end, uh, something's going to get real hot. 
you can do this if you have any sort of semiconductor uh, silicon diode. Uh, an LED won't work, its forward voltage is too high. But any of them with the forward voltage of 7 tenths or 8 tenths of a volt, which is common for silicon diodes, <clears throat> you can demonstrate this with the one and a half volt battery. You're not going to be able to hold the wire or the, the diode on there very long. It's going to get real hot because the battery is putting out a volt and a half, and alkaline batteries put out lots of current. Uh, and an LED has a higher forward voltage than that. You might need two batteries or maybe three to make an LED light up, but it's forward current that makes the LED emit light. If you keep the current running too long and have too much current, the junction is going to get too hot. The junction is this little dotted line up here in our PN diode. The junction is a little line in there, and that's where all the uh, special semiconductor action takes place. Out here in the bulk regions, it's just flows of electrons. The electrons flow from the negative side, the cathode to the anode. They flow through the N part, and then they flow through the P part, and Electrons flow where holes are backfilling the electrons, or you could say electrons backfill the holes, whichever device you're talking about. Uh, so we talked about forward bias makes positive current. Positive conventional current always flows into the anode, comes out the cathode. Now Zener diode we talked about in the amps and power supply section keeps a constant voltage drop when it's reverse biased. You have to put the positive voltage on its cathode and then it will have like a 12 volt or seven volt or 10 volt, whatever the voltage the Zener diode's rated at, it will have that constant voltage drop from cathode to anode. Otherwise, if you put a positive bias on a Zener diode, it acts just like a forward bias uh, silicon diode. It'll just run current. That's what it, what's what it is, is a uh, silicon diode with a reverse breakdown characteristic specified at a, uh, a voltage. Now, variactor diodes are built a little bit different in that their uh, PN junction is modified so that they can take a, a wide range of reverse bias voltage and change the capacitance across that diode. Now that's useful in tuning RF circuits. Those are actually used in voltage controlled oscillators. Uh, let's see, you can take a piece of semiconductor, an n type semiconductor, and just put metal on top of it and form yourself a Schottky diode. And the advantage that a Schottky diode has is that it has a lower forward voltage drop. Uh, usually three tenths or four tenths of a volt, whereas the silicon diode has seven tenths to eight tenths of a volt, about half. But that's a Schottky diode. And that's useful when you want a lower forward voltage drop. Uh, pin diodes are used as an RF switch. They have a real low junction capacitance and the diode is switched on and off by a forward DC bias current. These are just different specialized applications of diodes as people have developed those since the um, 1960s when these uh, semiconductor junctions were first uh, discovered and studied. The, um, then if you want to get three pieces of uh, dope silicon together, you can make yourself a bipolar transistor. It's got the diode. This diode would, would form the base emitter junction. 
The base would be the anode. The emitter would be the cathode. So that's the PN part. And then you put another N-type silicon material on top of the, the P-type. And so you've got a sandwich now. You've got N-type material on one end, P-type in the middle, and N-type on the other end. And you, if you put forward bias into the base emitter junction, you can regulate the current in the collector. That's what was the, the fascinating discovery about bipolar transistors is that you could control a big current, the big, control a very high collector current with a very low base current. And we might have a question about that, the ratio of collector current to base current. Uh, the VBE, it's a forward bias diode. So it's going to look like six tenths to seven tenths of a volt. Now, then, then came along uh, field effect transistors. There's a junction FET, which has a very high input impedance. This, was, this diagram in the middle under JFET is showing a P-channel JFET. Because you see this little arrow? It just leaves off the, the bar for the cathode. The anode is hooked to the channel. It's a piece of silicon that the, the top one's called the drain, the bottom one the source. I don't know if you need to know that, but that's what they are, drain and source. And this is the gate coming out here. The anode of the gate is hooked to the silicon between the drain and the source. So the cathode of, the, of this diode comes out here as the gate. Now this is a P-channel JFET because the positive side of the silicon in this diode is the channel between the drain and the source. Because you run this as a reverse bias diode, you have a high input impedance. There's very little current flowing. So impedance is just like Ohm's law. It's voltage divided by current. So if you have some voltage and a very teeny tiny current, that's going to come out to be a very high input impedance. Now this, this concept of input impedance is all over the place. Electronics, RF, everywhere. So you need to, to get established what that is. It's Ohm's law. Very high voltage, very low current. The ratio of voltage to current is the impedance. Uh, the same thing with the MOSFETs, metal oxide semiconductor onto a field effect transistor. The field effect transistor is again a silicon channel between drain and source. And this time we have an end channel because see this error over here on the source? It points toward the channel and, and it just left off. The, the symbols leave off the cathode bar for the inside of that diode. The cathode bar is what forms the channel. The cathode region is in, in doped silicon that forms the channel. So it's an in channel MOSFET. The gate, this is called, still called a gate, and it's insulated from the channel by the oxide. This oxide in MOS, MOS is metal oxide silicon field effect transistor, metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor, MOSFET. Uh, the gate is insulated from the channel, and so it's a very high input impedance. It's so high that you, you really can't measure it. And the only leakage current may be through a protective Zener diode, like a Zener diode here that's set at a voltage, maybe even 30, 40, or 50 volts, so as not to overstress this insulator between the gate and the channel. If you overstress that insulator, 
it's going to blow a hole in that insulator and the thing won't work anymore. It's got to stay insulated. And so very high voltages like ESD voltage of several thousand volts can blow these up. So you have to be careful about very high voltages and some MOSFETs have protective zener diodes on their gates to the source. Um, then people started seeing that there's useful combinations in putting some of these devices together. Uh, the first useful combination we find is if you take an LED and forward bias the LED so it gives off light, the light will make the channel in a FET, in a field effect transistor conduct. Now what this does, this is gonna make it work like a relay because there's no electrical connection between this LED and the FET. The FET is totally isolated from the LED. The only path across there is something for the light to get to the FET and turn it on. So you forward bias the LED, it turns on this FET, and it flows current just like a normal transistor would as if you had voltage on its gate. There's no gate. The transistor turns on by the light from the LED. That would be called an optocoupler or an, an optical relay. We'll come across those later. Or that says you can use a pin diode to be a, a you can use a pin diode to replace a mechanical switch. Those are usually used for antenna switching where there's very low signal levels, like receiving antennas. And then people started putting transistors together to form logic circuits. That is, they wanted an output from a logic circuit when two inputs were high, but if either input was not a high voltage, they didn't want any output from the circuit. So they made AND gates and OR gates. They made different logic gates. We'll go through some logic gates. Uh, believe that's next week. We'll talk about logic gates. But this is the silicon innards of a logic gate. Uh, the, this first combination is you put bipolar transistors to make TTL CMOS logic. Use MOS transistors to make CMOS logic. C is complementary. So, and so it uses an N-channel and a P-channel MOSFET to make CMOS logic gates. The, the advantage of this is, is that since the bipolar transistors work on current, they draw lots of current, they get hot. That's why you need amps of, of power supply capability for TTL logic gate circuits. MOS transistors work on voltage. See the voltage on the gate is what turns the MOSFET transistor on. So it's a uh, very high impedance. It doesn't use as much current. Uh, the another advantage of CMOS logic gates is their switching threshold is about half the power supply voltage. So you can run CMOS on five volts and its switching threshold is about 2.4 to 2.5 volts. TTL, what makes TTL switch? It's the current into the base. Now sometimes uh, logic, TTL logic gates with bipolar transistors will have two transistors you have to turn on in series. So that's up about 1.4 volts. So the switching threshold of TTL is between 0.7 and 1.4 volts. And the switching threshold in CMOS is about half the power supply voltage. And its power supply, uh, there's logic, uh, the original RCA CMOS logic circuits went up to 18 volts. And I've used them at 20, although there's problems doing that. Sometimes that leads to failures, but it can go as high as, as 18 volts or 20 volts. Another useful combination is to make what's called bi CMOS logic, where you have a CMOS input for very high input impedance inputs, 
combine that with a low impedance output stage, which would be a, a bipolar transistor. And that way you get very high input impedance and very low output impedance drivers that are capable of producing very high current. Like if you wanted to use your logic gate to run uh, inputs to relays. Uh, let's see here, here at the top, let's uh, magnify that up a little bit. This is a thing called a uh, MMIC, Monolithic Microwave Integrated Circuit. Monolithic means it's a circuit made in one little piece of silicon and it's tiny. It's like the size of a pinhead. And RF integrated circuits can be made this way with 50 ohm input impedance and 50 ohm output impedance. And those impedances will stay constant over its frequency range. They'll have controlled gain and a low noise figure. Uh, you remember from our talk on receivers, low, low noise figure is very important because that reduces the noise that's added to your signal you're trying to listen to. These guys can have very low noise figure, constant impedance, and the impedance is constant over its frequency range. Uh, they're arranged a lot. Most of them have four pins. If you're looking in your book, there's better pictures in this. This is kind of my, because I felt artistic that day when I was doing this. Uh, it's fed with the micro strip. The RF comes in and micro strip. That's a, a wide trace of copper on the, on the PC board. The output would also be taken off of micro strip. Uh, from from the RF out terminal and the two side terminals would be ground. So those would be connected to a ground plane. Ground plane and microstrip is very common and in making uh, printed RF circuits on PC boards. Now the VCC would come in through a choke or resistor or maybe both so as to give a high impedance to the RF and and so feed the power into the circuit this way. Uh, usually there would be a series capacitor on the input so as to block the uh, internal bias voltage on the input from going out to the source, what, whatever's feeding this amplifier. The highest frequency monolithic microwave integrated circuits use gallium nitride or gallium arsenide because of higher electron mobility. I mean, back to our PN junction. You remember in the PN junction, we said what makes this work is electrons moving around. If the electrons are slow, they're not gonna be very fast. You can't change them real quickly. But in these different uh, semiconductor materials, the gallium nitride and gallium arsenide, the electrons move faster. And that's measured by electron mobility. There's, there's actual measurements on semiconductor type, semiconductor materials called electron mobility. And you measure that to determine how fast your device can switch, how fast of a analog signal it can amplify, how fast can you change the charges in the silicon and make it, make it oscillate, make it amplify, and that's the higher electron mobility that makes that happen. Uh, let's see, I don't remember. It's been a couple of days since I did this. Um, before we get to PC boards. Okay, a comparator is a bit like an op amp. Oh, we haven't talked about op amps like yet. That's next week. We'll get to op amps next week, but an op operational amplifier is a differential amplifier. It has a differential input. There's a positive and a negative input. Um, we'll, we'll talk more about that next week with op amps, but a comparator is built like an op amp. Uh, the difference is that a comparator has hysteresis to make it a good switch. An op amp, you wanna be a linear amplifier. You don't want it to switch. That, 
you can turn an op amp into a comparator, but the monolithic integrated circuit comparators are better than trying to build one yourself. The properties of both, they both have high input impedance on the inputs and low output impedance on the output. Uh, and the comparator has this hysteresis circuit that prevents input noise from causing an unstable output. Now you ask, what is hysteresis? Well, here's a here's a certain picture of, of something I've seen on an oscilloscope where you've got a noisy signal input. This top half of this picture is a analog signal input. It's got a lot of noise on it. And what's important here is that a comparator has a positive threshold and a negative threshold. For the output of the comparator, the output of the comparator is shown in the bottom half of this picture. So you see where the input signal goes above the positive threshold, the output switches to the high state. And the, the input signal can be noisy. It can bounce all over the place and go back above the positive threshold. Nothing's going to happen. It's already in the positive output. But when the input signal drops below the negative threshold, the output signal will go to the low output state. And then the input signal bounces around some more. It can go above the, the positive threshold. Now, when it goes above the positive threshold, the output's going to switch back to high. So the, the comparator is very useful for cleaning up noisy signals. That is, if this signal is really right and it just has this noise on it, then this is the bottom half of this is really what the input signal would represent, like from a switch or a transducer or something uh, where you want a logic on and off output. You use a comparator to clean up this uh, noisy input signal. <clears throat> That's what hysteresis means, is that the input, once, it, once the input crosses, crosses the positive threshold, the output goes high, but it has to cross the negative threshold before it goes back low. And it doesn't matter where it, the signal input is until it crosses the positive threshold again, it's not gonna switch. Now, I had a bunch of um, junk PC boards that I took a picture of so as to demonstrate different type components. I didn't want to dig through my junk boxes. For the people that are used to working with electronic components, you've seen all this before. Some people haven't. So I made pictures of these to show the comparisons because there's questions about it on the test. I've got some of these labeled, uh, like in the lower left-hand corner of this picture, let me see if I can make it any bigger, if that makes it plainer to see. The lower left-hand corner here, there, there's the body of, of a resistor or, and diodes. Uh, looks like this black one here may be a ferrite bead, like we talked about for high-frequency uh, oscillation. And those are called axial components the leads come out the axis of it. It's for, it's for a two-leaded component. It would be an axial component. A radial component is like these little uh, capacitors sitting here. I think these are ceramic capacitors. They got two legs coming out. They come out one side. And you see how they stand up over here? Their, their leads are coming out along the radius of it. So that's a radial component. Uh, these are like uh, TTL in, uh, logic chips in a DIP package. DIP is dual inline package. Dual inline, there's, there's pins on both sides of these. Some are 14, some are 16 pins, or maybe more. There's seven or eight on each side. Yeah, that's a 16. The, the shorter one's a 14 pin. Dual means there's pins on both sides. Inline package means it's a, a long flat package like this. And you can see how the pins come down and they solder down into the PC board. 
All these parts on this board are through hole parts. That means they go into a hole on the board. Now, let's see, We've, we're going to see through hole parts. Now on this top circuit board, uh, it's mostly surface mount parts. There are some through hole parts. This, uh, this is a big aluminum electrolytic capacitor. It's got its leads down into the board and the uh, TO220 transistors. I don't think they're exactly TO220 package. The TO220s I remember have a metal tab here at the top. This is a plastic tab where the hole is. But this is a TO220 style. There's three legs coming out that go into holes in the board. So those are still through hole parts. The surface mount parts, uh, just about everything else on here. Here's a surface mount connector, a surface mount PLCC, which is a plastic lead chip carrier. Here's a BGA, a ball grid array. All of its contacts are just little pads on the bottom of it that are soldered down to the PC board. Uh, most big parts like this, this would be a programmable array, programmable logic array. Uh, we'll get to that next week, what that is, but it's a surface mount part. And all these little dots you see in here, uh, if, you, if you look close, the picture's not that good. I can't uh, enlarge it anymore. Our surface mount parts, they're the, the same type parts as the axial leaded resistors. Uh, they're surface mount because they solder to pads on top of the board. There's no holes for these components to solder into. And if you look careful, you can see that the, the silk screen identification of each of the parts is larger than the parts themselves. So the surface mount parts take up a lot less board space. Uh, if you were to get this PLCC in a dip, it would be like four times the size to be on the same scale as the DIP TTL logic gates. And this is even, as I forget the name of the, the package where the leads come out, the short end of the, the plastic package instead of the long end. But those leads, surface mount leads are very much closer together and it's a surface mount package. Uh, well, I cut off the picture for the quad flat pack. This, this piece of the, of the component here at the top of the picture is a square package with leads coming out all four sides. That would be a quad flat pack for four sides. Uh, here's your input connector. I believe this might be an HDMI connector. Uh, this was like an old uh, uh, Blu-ray player board. I like tearing up things when they don't work. I'd like to see what's inside. It's a fun hobby to have. So if you see your neighbors throw out a Blu-ray player in their trash, grab it up, open it up, and look at all the parts inside. It's fun. Uh, I've been doing that since I was a kid old enough to hold a screwdriver. I took apart all kinds of things, but don't tell anybody. So anyway, it's leads, the, the connectors leads come out, they're surface mount pads. These little connectors here at the bottom come out and are surface mount. Uh, in contrast to the card edge connector, which is very much larger supporting the through hole PC board. This is like a video card out of an old XT computer. See, I tear things up when they don't work. And that's, if you've seen uh, my workroom in weeks past, yes, I have uh, old PC motherboards hanging on the ceiling. I think they make great wall art and ceiling art. Okay, so we talked about, oh, one other thing about surface mount parts. They have very much shorter traces, shorter leads. So there's less parasitic capacitance and inductance. You see in this top picture, the top PC board, how the components are all much closer together. There's very much less inductance in that than there is in this bottom picture of the through hole PC board with the dual inline package logic gates. Uh, we have radial and axial components. You saw a TO220. PLCC is a, a very much smaller logic gate than what would be a DIP. And we saw DIP packages in the BGA, ball grid array, 
is takes up much less room. There's parts are much closer together, way less uh, parasitic inductance. The the lines are a lot smaller. I don't know if you can tell that in the picture, but the lines, copper traces in the top picture are much smaller. So they will have much less capacitance than will the lines in the bottom picture where they're wide traces. Now the widest trace down here is the power distribution. Um, that's all. Questions? Now we'll move on to the question section. Let me uh, stop that one. And I need to share the questions components in your new rig. Hello. Um, do you see the thing components in your new rig? Anybody see that? Yes, sir. Good, thank you. In what application is gallium arsenide used as a semiconductor material? Uh, where's my marker? What application would gallium arsenide be used in? That's microwave circuits where you have very fast signals, gigahertz range and, and up. They can use them at multi tens of gigahertz. And that's what they're using for radars and cars up at 50 and 60 gigahertz is gallium arsenide. So it's microwave circuits. Which semiconductor material contains free electrons? Which one had electrons? Where's my marker? Here's the marker. Free electrons, that's in n-type material. N for negative because of the negative charge on electrons. Everybody knows electrons are negatively charged, right? That's good. You, should, you need to know that. What's the name given to an impurity atom that adds holes to the semiconductor structure? That is the acceptor. The acceptor impurity sucks up electrons and accepts extra electrons. What it is, it's elements that are, that are not silicon and your book might say what they are, but that's not the part of the question. But they're elements that you put in with the silicon semiconductor structure, semicon the silicon crystal structure that soaks up, that, that's looking for electrons. And so it steals the electrons from the silicon atoms. And so that adds a hole, that adds a place where an atom wants to be, a place where an electron wants to be. The electron's not there, so it's a hole. That's acceptor impurities that makes P-type semiconductor material. How does the DC impedance at the gate of a FET compare to a bipolar transistor? Remember what we said about the impedance of FETs and bipolars? Now, why isn't that staying? Uh, here we go. Microsoft software. That's my only comment about it. The FET has the higher input impedance. FET's a higher input impedance. It works on voltage, high voltage, low current, high impedance. The bipolar transistor has a sort of lower voltage, six or seven tenths of a volt to turn it on with a lot of current that's gonna be low impedance. So the FET is a higher impedance transistor. What's the beta of the bipolar junction transistor? Oh, we never did say what that was. Anybody know what the beta is? Beta is a change in collector current with base current. The bipolar transistor works because you put base current in and it can control a big, heavy, much higher collector current. And the ratio of how much it can control is collector current divided by base current. 
And so you get a beta. Uh, some betas of transistors are like, power transistors are like low 20 or 30 or 40. So a one milliamp base current would only be 40 milliamps in the collector. Uh, signal transistors that have, have higher gain, the betas can be 100 or 200. And there's some super beta transistors that have 1,000. So a microamp of base current, which is a very teeny tiny signal current going into the base, could control 1,000 times that much current in the collector, which would be a milliamp. And so that gets you up into a, a normal transistor collector current range. You feed that milliamp into another transistor and you can boost up the voltage, you can boost up the current. But that's called the beta of the bipolar transistor junction. Change in collector current to base current. Which of the following indicates the silicon NPN junction is biased on. How do you know you when you turn on a silicon transistor? The base emitter voltage, six tenths to seven tenths of a volt, is how you know that transistor is on. Doesn't have anything to do with resistance, and it's certainly not six volts. It's six tenths of a volt for a silicon bipolar transistor. What term indicates the frequency? This is a, a um, this is a parameter that you find on transistor data sheets. It doesn't tell you all that, but it tells you the frequency. Oh, I messed up. Where the grounded base current, you put the transistor at a grounded base configuration and start increasing the frequency from a kilohertz and going up. And when you get down to seven tenths of that current, that is called the alpha cutoff frequency. And that's a common way to measure how fast transistors are. Alpha cutoff frequencies of power transistors are going to be very low, maybe not even tens of kilohertz, maybe not even 10 kilohertz. Signal transistors, alpha cutoff can be three or 400 megahertz, but they're not going to be gigahertz. When once you get to gigahertz, silicon is getting rather slow. That's why there's other types of materials for microwave semiconductors. The alpha cutoff frequency is the frequency where the grounded base current has decreased to seven tenths of what it was at a kilohertz. And that comes from the uh, transistor data sheet. That's why if you're gonna use a transistor, it's very, very useful to have its data sheet even if it just has a few parameters on it. It tells you the maximum current, tells you uh, internal capacitances, and it'll tell you the cutoff frequency. Sometimes it'll say cutoff frequency, but it's the alpha cutoff frequency. <clears throat> what is the depletion mode FET? FETs come in different modes. Here we wanna talk about depletion mode. A depletion mode FET Let's current flow if the, if the uh, gate to source voltage is zero. So no gate voltage is applied. The source of a FET is always the reference. In, in this type amplifier and a depletion mode FET lets current flow from the drain to the source with no voltage applied. So when you apply voltage, it's going to shut that current off. That's how the, the voltage on the gate of the FET controls the drain source current. The drain is similar to collector and the source similar to emitter in bipolar transistors. So the, the, the FET 
gate voltage is zero, you're going to get current flowing through it. So you have to put voltage on the gate to turn that current off is how you control a depletion mode fit. Uh, here's some schematic symbols. Uh, we didn't talk about the transistor symbols much. Well, yeah, we did a little bit. So what's the symbol for an in-channel dual gate MOSFET? The uh, trick here is it's dual gates. So you look for one with dual gates. We want in-channel. Uh, here's two with dual gates. Now, you remember the trick that I was telling you about the arrow? The arrow is like a diode with the line for the cathode cut off. So if the cathode's cut off, it's the end part negative, it's the end charged region, end, end doped region of the semiconductor, that's the channel. So this would be the end channel dual gate MOSFET. Those were popular uh, uh, several years back for mixers. You would feed the local oscillator in one gate, your signal from the antenna to the other gate, this would mix it. What comes out the drain is uh, signals at the intermediate frequency. You remember that from the chapter on receivers. You had mixers. We use these for a mixer. You can put two signals in and the transistor uh, control laws by the gate voltage onto the channel makes the IF mix frequency come out. And this is an end channel because the end part of the diode is the channel of the transistor. Now it's, that's number four. Number four would be the correct answer. Um, remember on the test, the, the answers are gonna be in different, no, oh, I messed up. Word does that sometimes. The answers can be in different order but they're not gonna reword the questions. And if you get this question on your test, you will have this diagram with it. So it will show you these. Now remember, if the arrow is pointing out, the cathode of this diode is over here on the right toward the drain and the source. Well, that's the end part of the diode. So the P, chart, P part of the diode is forming the channel. That would be a P channel. Number four is the end channel where the, the, the bar for the cathode is the channel of the transistor. Did I mess that up too bad? I hope not. Next, uh, in the same figure, what's the schematic for a P-channel JFET? Now let's go back up here to the figure. We were looking for a P-channel JFET. Um, well, gates like this, where they're insulated from the channel or MOSFETs, here's a JFET. Is this a P or N channel? Number one, uh, if you put the cathode bar in at the end of the era, that would make a P channel JFET. Is that the question? P channel JFET. So it's number one, A. Oh, we got the right answer. Hooray. Um, why do many MOSFET devices have internally connected Zener diodes on the gates? MOSFETs with Zener diode on the gate was for what purpose? To reduce the chance of static damage. Static meaning a high voltage charge, static electricity, several thousand volts easily. We'll, we'll pop that gate, pop the oxide between the gate and the channel. What is the most useful characteristic of a Zener diode? What, what have we said it's good for? Um, it holds a constant voltage drop under changing current. In our linear regulator that we used a Zener diode as the reference device, as the output current changes, the base current is gonna to have to change in that pass transistor and the Zener diode reference 
will hold the constant voltage drop even though its current is changing. That's how that linear regulator works using the Zener diode. Well, that's what makes it good because the Zener is sort of a voltage reference. It has, it, it'll change a little bit. That's in the data sheet. That's why you need data sheets with these components. The data sheet will tell you how much the Zener voltage is going to change by changing the current through it. What's an important characteristic of a Schottky diode compared to ordinary silicon diode when you use it as a power supply rectifier? It doesn't have to be a power supply rectifier. It's there all the time. It has less forward voltage drop. In a power supply rectifier, that means you don't drop as much voltage across the diode. So the same current through the diode with less voltage across it is going to dissipate less power, which equals higher efficiency. Everybody's in power supply design is always about efficiency. That's what power supply design's about. Provide a constant voltage out and high efficiency. So using Schottky diodes instead of your ordinary silicon diodes gives you less forward voltage drop, less power dissipated. What type of bias is required for an LED to make light? For an LED to give off light, you need forward bias. You have to run forward conventional current through that LED. Forward bias lights up an LED. Come back here. Is that next that my screen's jumping? Sorry. What type of semiconductor device is designed for use as a voltage control comparator, capacitor, capacitor, not comparator? A semiconductor that's a voltage control capacitor is called a varactor diode. Where's my? Oh, that's up. I don't know what's happened to my title bar in here. Maybe that's what that's for. Maybe that'll work. Varactor diode. Now I remembered how to make that stay there. It's that little pin over here at the side when it's disappeared. Okay, voltage control capacitor is a varactor diode. Use that in voltage controlled oscillators because you use this capacitor as part of the, you remember from uh, our discussion of oscillators, we had uh, controlling capacitors that resonate with an inductance. If you change the capacitor, it changes the frequency. Well, if you use a varactor diode in that VFO, change the voltage on it, you just change the frequency. So now you can use a voltage to control the frequency instead of turning a knob of of a variable capacitor. What is the failure mechanism when a junction diode fails due to excess current? When a junction diode fails and it's had excess current, it's because the junction got too hot. The junction in a diode and all semiconductor devices are built from the basic diode. I think you missed a question. I missed a question, I'm sorry. Well, all right, let me finish this and then we'll go back and get it. When the junction diode, when the junction of the semiconductor diodes get too hot, they fail. Uh, I missed a question. Well, I'm sorry I didn't put it in the list. Okay, so let's find out where we are. So what's the question? Somebody with the book, can you say? VO6. Which is the following is a common use of the Schottky diode? There oh, it is, right oh, there. Now I remember that that question has been withdrawn. Uh, if you go to remember the first week we sent out the list of um, of uh, internet web pages as references. 
One of those was the question pool. And that question pool will tell you which questions are withdrawn. Uh, they'll do that. And the, the answer is, uh, which of the following is a common use of a shocky dog? It's on page 180 in your book if you want to look at it. But officially, according to ARRL and the uh, question pool website, this question is withdrawn. It's because there's more than one correct answer. And they didn't put down all the answers are correct, but only, well, I've used Schottky diodes uh, in two of these applications, but you could use it as a rectifier in high current power supplies. That's the common use. So that would be answer A. Well, the book says answer D. D is a VHF UHF mixer or detector. That's another use of a Schottky diode. Um, I doubt if it'd be a, a good use as a constant voltage reference as a Zener diode. It might work as a variable capacitance as, as a VAR actor, but for sure it's a rectifier and high current power supplies. I've used them there, uh, but I haven't built many UHF circuits and used it as a mixer even though that's the answer in the, in the question pool. Now the, the, the question pool authors have withdrawn this question. This will not show up on your test. So it's, it's not even good for extra credit because there's, the answer is ambiguous. So cross that one off. It's not gonna be there, guaranteed. E6B07, the junction temperature is what makes diodes fail. Okay, we did that one. Now what? E6B08. Which of the following is a junction barrier diode? How's a junction barrier diode made? It's made with a semiconductor and a metal junction. It's all about the junction in semiconductors. And the first junction is a PN junction that forms a diode. Shocky diode is a metal to a piece of semiconductor. Uh, point contact diode. Anybody seen point contact diodes? They used to come in clear glass. There was a piece of silicon and a little very tiny wire whisker inside that made a contact to that piece of silicon. And because of that, it didn't have the capacitance of a regular junction in a silicon diode. So they can use those as RF detectors. The first point contact diodes were not even pieces of silicon. They were uh, germanium, as in germanium crystal diode detector in your uh, power, in your unpowered germanium diode AM radio receiver. Anybody ever make those? You talking about old crystal radio? An old crystal radio. That was a point contact diode. Yes. They use them as RF detectors. They've been working like that since uh, when, 1910s or 20s. You could make crystal radios with them. Well, they took that crystal, got a little piece of it, stuck a end of a very fine wire to it, put it in a little piece of clear glass and called it a point contact diode. That's what it's for. Why does a PN junction diode not conduct when it's reversed biased? Why does that not conduct? Because Holes in the p-type material are separated from the electrons in the n-type material because of the voltage. The voltage pulls the holes to one end and the electrons to the other. See so if you put, remember our example, you put a positive terminal of a battery on the n, the, the n-type full of electron in the p-n diode. The electrons are drawn toward the positive charge of that battery. 
it's, it's all about attraction of electrons to positive charge. Electrons are negative charge. They repel the negative. The holes are P-type material. So those holes are drawn toward the electrons trying to come out of the negative side of that battery. They're separated by the applied voltage. No current's gonna flow. It's gonna sit there. So the PN junction diode does not conduct when reverse biased because you're pulling the carriers apart. The, the holes and electrons are called carriers. The holes are in the P-type, the electrons are in the N-type and you separate them by the voltage you're putting on there. They're not gonna get together at the junction and flow across the junction and provide current through that diode. There is no current in a reverse bias diode. The P's separate to one side, the N's separate to the other, drawn there by the applied voltage, no current flows. Everybody straight? Questions? Because sometimes that's the hardest concept to get about P-N junctions, is holes and electrons and where they go and why they don't move. But if you got it, everything's great. All right, we'll move on. What characteristic of a pin diode makes it useful as an RF switch? What was special about a pin diode? You remember? Um, reverse bias, that's not right. Low junction capacitance. I thought that reverse bias sounded strange. It's low junction capacitance of a pin diode. Very low capacitance makes a good RF switch. You turn it off, there's very low capacitance across the junction. You turn it on, it's a uh, low impedance. Use these a lot. I've seen uh, RDF antennas made with pin diodes where the antennas in the antenna are switched automatically. And so it's a very, very good use for radio direction finding. We'll talk about that when do you talk about RDF? Oh, in the antenna section this afternoon. So you have to come back this afternoon to hear about RDF, radio direction finding in the antenna section. Antennas are very interesting. It's what makes every radio work. Radios don't work without antennas. So you need to hear that. Never mind. Uh, what's used to control the attenuation of RF signals by the pin diode? What's used to control the attenuation if you want to make a variable attenuator? You can use a forward DC bias current and change the attenuation. So there you have a voltage controlled attenuator. And it works well at RF signals because of its low junction capacitance. See how this ties together? Isn't that cool? The RF stuff is fun. You may not believe that, but it really is. Just get it, get in with it and play with it. It's fun. I always like having fun, like tearing up things that don't work. What is a solid state relay? A solid state relay uses semiconductors to implement the functions of an electromechanical relay. The relay with the solenoid and contacts is an electromechanical relay. It's made out of an electric part and a mechanical part and semiconductors can implement that function. And it's called a solid state relay. They're very useful. And, and they, they're very useful because they uh, are a lot less have a lot less mass, so they don't weigh near as much. They also don't bounce. They, they're debounced automatically. Yes. They don't have a spring inside to make the contacts bounce. That's very good. Thank you, Hugh. That was Hugh, right? Uh, yes, that was me. Maybe. Okay. Um, see the next page. What's on the next page? Oh, schematic symbols again. All right, we're looking for a schematic symbol for an LED. Is that right? 
LED schematic symbol. Which one's the LED? It's the ones with the light coming out, number five. That's an LED. So number five is the answer. Here it's the second choice. Don't, don't remember the letters, but number five will be the LED. But, you, but that's a, you don't even see number five. You see the arrows coming out because that's the light coming out. What's the advantage of CMOS logic devices over TTL? Remember, we talked about this. CMOS logic devices have lower power consumption because they don't run as much current. So they don't, they don't dissipate the power. Why do CMOS digital integrated circuits have high immunity to noise? on the input or power supply. CMOS has a very good immunity to noise because the switching threshold is half the power supply voltage. See, instead of being a, having a switching threshold of a volt, uh, if you put the, uh, very commonly, we would use CMOS uh, logic at 15 volts. So there the switching threshold is seven and a half volts. So you could have two or three or four volts of noise on your input lines and it's not gonna change the, the logic states. But if you put three or four volts of noise on TTL gates, integrated circuit inputs, they're not gates, they're inputs, uh, it's gonna switch the logic all over the place. So this is a high immunity to noise when your switching threshold is at half the power supply voltage. What's the most common input and output impedance of MIMICS? Monolithic microwave integrated circuits. That's 50 ohms, the most common RF impedance. They might make others, but the most common input and output impedance is 50 ohms. That's where most of them are. What characteristics of the MMIC make it a popular choice for VHF through microwave circuits? Why would, you, why would it be a popular choice? How about this one? It's got all the good stuff in it. It's got control gain, it's got a low noise figure, it's got constant input and output impedances over the frequency range it's specified for. Which of the following materials is likely to provide the highest frequency of operation in an MMIC? What, what is it? silicon, silicon nitride, silicon dioxide, or gallium nitride? Go for the gallium nitride. Gallium makes it very fast. And the nitride is what it takes to make it to a useful semiconductor. So for a MMIC, go with gallium. How is power supplied to the most common type of MMIC? We want a power supplied. It has to have a little bit of power to make it work, a little bit of current. It's through the resistor and choke connected to the output pin is how you power it. What type of transmission line is used for connections to it? What kind of transmission line do you put down on a PC board? That's the micro strip. These others are just too clunky to work with. You want something small, something printed on a PC board, it's called micro strip. Why is gallium arsenide useful for semiconductors at UHF and higher? Gallium arsenide has higher electron mobility. How fast can you move the electrons around? It's all that matters. 
when you want fast integrated circuits. What is the function of hysteresis in a comparator? Remember our example of hysteresis? Input signal can be noisy. And the hysteresis keeps the output signal stable, even though the input's noisy. Well, I guess I should highlight prevent. That's the what it does. It prevents input noise from causing unstable output. That's what it does. Hey, John, Wayne, I always use the, the term dampening with hysteresis. It, it might help them understand hysteresis using the word dampening. Can, can you explain how dampening works in a comparator? Well, it, it, it keeps it stable from the fuzz from re making it react. Uh-huh. So it's 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 another word for the same uh, same effect, right? You, you, right. You want to keep the output signal stable, so dampening would prevent the input noise from messing it up. Right. Yeah, I think I've heard that. It's been a while since I did. I always just called it hysteresis. I thought hysteresis was a neat word. So that's what I adopted in my language. When you say hysteresis to people that don't know about electronics and comparators, they look at you and go, huh? How do you know about that? Well, I, they think it's like something, a, a psychological condition or something. But it, it keeps comparators from being having unstable outputs. Or it's dampening. science. It makes us sound smarter. That's right. That's there you go. Okay. What happens when the level of a comparator's input signal crosses the threshold? What happens when the input crosses the threshold? The comparator changed the output state. Okay, it had to cross the positive threshold or the negative threshold. To, to go positive or go negative. What advantage does surface mount technology offer at RF compared to using through hole components? What advantage does surface mount technology have for RF circuits? Well, it has smaller circuit area. It has shorter board traces. Uh, there's less parasitic inductance and capacitance. All those things are good for RF circuits. That's all you want in RF circuits is small size, shorter board traces, which reduces inductance and less capacitance. The parts are smaller, so there's less capacitance around the parts and around the connection, connecting circuits. Through hole components would have Lots of inductance because of the long leads. Which of the following component package types are most suitable for use at frequencies above HF? What would you use for above HF range? About surface mount parts. We just talked about all their advantages. Especially necessary above um, in, in the microwave range. They all have to be surface mount. HF, you might can get away with TO220s at 30 megahertz, but at two meters and, and 70 centimeters, you're only gonna see surface mount parts. Which of the following device packages is a through hole type? We're looking for a through hole part. Which ones are through holes? It's gonna be the dips. Dip is a through hole. PLCC with surface mount, ball grid array surface mount. SOT, that's the little three terminal transistors of surface mount. Like the most common type would be SOT 23. Is how I say it. Some people might say SOT 23, but okay, we're different. 
It's a, the dip is the through hole part. Why are dip through hole package ICs not used at UHF for higher frequencies? Why wouldn't they be used at UHF? Uh, it's because their leads are too long. Because inside that plastic package, there's a big long lead before you even get to the silicon chip. And then you have to bring it out to leads that uh, that bend down from the side of the package and go to a hole in a PC board. And then there's a big long length to get from that hole around all the other holes to get to where it's going. Lead length is a part of dip packages. They're not used at high frequencies. What's the characteristic of dip packaging used for integrated circuits? How would you describe dip packaging for integrated circuits? Dual inline package means two rows of connecting pins on opposite sides of the package. That's why it's called the dual inline package. Where's this? There we go. Two rows of connecting pins. It's a dual inline package. Oh, that's it. 